Hello, hello. Welcome in to the Audio Ground School podcast. I am your host, Nick Smith, founder and creator of Part-Time Pilot. Welcome in. If you are brand new, we are going through IFR, our IFR online ground school. So we're in about lesson seven of our IFR online ground school. If you're here for private pilot lessons, go back to episode one. We already went through our private pilot online ground school and did some check ride prep episodes. Those are all in the first, you know, hundred or so episodes of the Audio Ground School podcast. So subscribe, go back, start from the beginning and your podcast app should just step you through all the lessons right there for you. And then if you're interested in having maybe an ad free version, something where I'm not rambling on like I am now, we have a VIP podcast where you can still listen to that on your favorite podcast app and you get a special VIP podcast invitation link sent to you when you join our online ground school lifetime membership at parttimepilot.com. So just wanted to throw that out there. Today's episode is going to, like I said, continue on with our IFR online ground school. And we're in the step one IFR online ground school lessons course. That's where you'll get the written lessons, the images, the mnemonics, the videos, the audio lessons, and the quizzes. And then after that, we go on to step two, which prepares you for the FA IFR written exam. We do practice tests, a, re a report, and we work with you to get you ready for the FA written exam for IFR. And so we do both, right? We do the online ground school to make sure you understand the concepts at the fundamental level and can answer any question you might get from your flight instructor or experience during your flight training. So you're ready for flight training. But then we also do the written prep stuff. So we're both ground school and written prep. Make sure that you are ready and pass that written test, which we have a 99.9% .9 success rate doing for our students. And if you don't fail, which only a couple have out of thousands, then we'll give you your money back and still help you to pass the second time, which is what we've done both times in that case. All right. So we're in that step one course. And let's see here. We've covered turns and turn rates in two weeks ago. Then we did magnetic compass. And now we're going to talk about flight with instruments. So the first six or so lessons, you know, we were talking about instruments, different, you know, the pedostatic instruments, vacuum instruments, turns and turn rates. So we're all talking about our instruments, getting familiar with these instruments. A lot of this was a review. And now we're going to get into that flight using the instruments, which obviously is very important for IFR flight. So that's today's episode and lesson is going to be on flight with instruments. Now, before we get to that, I just have a couple updates. Last week, we announced our summer scholarship winners. So I just wanted to shout out to Anthony Padilla, the winner of our $1,200 summer scholarship. Already sent that money off to Anthony. Anthony showed huge determination in his application to make things work. He also showed that he is a you know really good dad, husband, all the stuff that, that makes a hard worker and determined person still wanting to experience their dreams in life. So just all around seemed like a great guy and someone that was perfect for our scholarship and that the $1,200 could really help him out and get his flight training career off to a great start. And then the runner up was Aisha Wise. She got free ground school. So she was already in our ground school, but we just gave her that money back. And so Aisha, again, a great story on determination you know, an inspiring story. She's always wanted to kind of be a pilot or had these dreams of aviation, but she had some hearing problems. So kind of was deterred a little bit by that. But then she was working in Antarctica, flying in twin otters and kind of rejuvenated that spirit of aviation for her. And then she buckled down and went through the medical process and got a first class medical and is starting her flight training, even with her hearing disability. So a lot of people out there, a lot of on the internet, they say, you know, you might have this eyesight problem, you might have this hearing problem, you might be missing a limb. There is always an example of someone who just wants it enough who will go out there and find a way to do it. And, you know, we see that a lot with like financial situations. I know flight training was hard for me, but I've seen so many students with even tougher financial situations than me make it work and make piloting even a career out of it where they completely flip over their financial situation. You know, some tenured pilots these days are making over a million dollars a year. That's pretty crazy. So it, I think I saw somewhere that it's now 
I'm forgetting the word, but like the the ratio of what you have to pay for the training versus what you can end up getting in life to be a pilot, commercial pilot, now outweighs it's better than a lawyer or a doctor. You know, that ratio of the investment to the outcome of what you get is better than those two, those other two careers, which are known as high paying careers. So really, really cool stuff. I have a couple updates. You know, we just released inside the IFR and Private Pilot Online Ground School new digital flashcards. We always had a PDF flashcard download, which had, you know, our complete question bank. But, you know, it wasn't the most user friendly. So we made some digital flashcards. So if you're a member, just look at under my courses, you'll have a new bonus course. And that's where you can access your digital flashcards. Each time you do the flashcards, it randomly takes 100 questions out of our over thousands of question bank, right? It takes a hundred and you just go through it. So let's say you answer option B, immediately it's gonna tell you whether option B is right or wrong. And then it'll tell you an explanation. Uh, If the figure has images, you can do images with our figures. You know, that was something that was kind of lacking in the PDF flashcard as well. And you can zoom in on the images, just makes for a much greater user experience and endless amounts of practice for the FAA written because we have so many questions that are updated with the latest FAA type of questions they're asking and you can access that whenever you want from any device you know ipad iphone android desktop computer macbook whatever any device you can access those flashcards and use them pretty seamlessly so i love how they're working so far so go ahead and check that out it's a new feature in the online ground school and then just a couple things that are kind of coming up that we're working on now i mentioned this a few weeks back You know, I like to use this podcast to tell you what we're up to, how we're improving, what we're doing. You know, we might have scholarships, other free content that you can use. And so I kind of like to use this as a bit of a newsletter for you all. And if you want, you can obviously just skip ahead to the lesson. But we're going to add a notes feature to the lessons, allowing students to take their own notes online. So if you see something you want to remember or you have a question you want to remember to ask us or something, you can just jot that in the notes. And then it'll save your notes and you should be able, we're going to hopefully work it out to where you can be able to download your notes and stuff like that. So I think that's a really, really cool feature. Another thing we are doing is we're looking into kind of updating some of our older videos, making those even better, more visually appealing. Let's see here. What else? An IFR study guide is in the works. Additional kind of videos. I already kind of mentioned that. Yeah. So more things. I'm sure more will come up. But those are the things we're kind of working on, just kind of sitting back and updating and making everything better for you guys. We're always trying to improve for you guys and just make it better and better and better. So, all right, without further ado, let's get into today's episode and lesson on flight with instruments from the part-time pilot IFR online ground school. To become an instrument rated pilot, you need to know how to use your instruments. So let's talk about those instruments as well as how they work how to use them, and the skills you will need to use them properly. There are three fundamental skills you need to use your instruments properly. First one is cross-checking. This simply means looking or scanning all your available instruments on a continuous basis. Second is interpretation. Once you have scanned all your instruments, you need to be able to quickly interpret what they are telling you. And the last one is aircraft control. Once you have scanned and interpreted the instruments, you then need to adjust your aircraft to get those instruments to read what you want. The above skills are also listed in the correct sequence in which to use them, cross-checking, interpretation, and aircraft control. There are two specific methods that incorporate these skills. The first method is control and performance method. Achieve desired aircraft performance by controlling aircraft attitude, first to your desired result, and then adjusting power accordingly. This method groups your flight instruments into two groups based off of how slow or fast the instruments provide feedback. The first group is control instruments and consists of attitude indicator, turn coordinator, tachometer, and manifold pressure. These instruments give immediate feedback on attitude and power adjustments, which allows a pilot to perform precise incremental adjustments. The second group is performance instruments and it consists of altimeter, airspeed indicator, and VSI. These instruments indicate the actual performance with a bit of a lag and feedback of the aircraft and tell you whether or not your adjustments using the control instruments are doing what you want them to do. Here are the steps on how you can perform this method. 
First, use your control instruments to establish the proper attitude for your desired maneuver. Then trim the aircraft to these attitude inputs to lighten your workload. Next, use your performance instruments to make sure the aircraft is doing what you want it to do. So let's do an example of what I mean in this control and performance method. So we talked about how we have control instruments. Those give us immediate feedback. So we use them to input the controls that we want into the aircraft and we see the immediate feedback. So we can use them to say, okay, that's enough control for what I want. Then we use the performance instruments to kind of make sure that the control inputs were right, right? It's kind of like a feedback loop. And if the performance instruments, which have a bit of a lag, like the altimeter, airspeed indicator, and VSI, they have a little bit of lag. So we put in our control using our control instruments. Then we wait a little bit and use our performance instruments to then see how we did. And if we're not quite there, we make another control adjustment and then use our performance instruments again. And we kind of do that feedback loop until we get what we want. So here's an example. Say we want to enter a controlled 500 feet per minute wings level descent on a heading of 210, starting from 125 knots at cruise at 8,000 feet. So what we're going to do is we're going to use our control instruments to adjust pitch and power to enter a descent. That would be the attitude indicator, tachometer, and manifold pressure. So we're going to use those to adjust our pitch and power how we think we need them to enter this descent. Then we're going to trim the aircraft to the pitch attitude for our descent. Then we'll use our performance instruments to make sure that we're on a 500 feet per minute descent that we want. So we'll want to see our VSI near, near 500 feet per minute, our airspeed indicator showing safe desired airspeed, and our altimeter decreasing, right? We're going to show our performance instruments want to show us that we are having the performance that we want based off the controls we input. If our VSI in this instance is not 500 feet per minute or your airspeed is too fast or slow, then we would adjust our controls again using our control instruments and repeat the process of this loop using our control instruments and our performance instruments. And the second method is primary and supporting method. This method groups your instruments into three groups based off of whether or not the instruments can be changed by the group maneuver. For pitch, altimeter, airspeed indicator, VSI, and attitude indicator, a change in pitch can result in a change in these instruments. For bank, heading indicator, turn coordinator, attitude indicator, and magnetic compass, a change in bank angle can result in a change in these instruments. For power, airspeed indicator, tachometer, or manifold pressure gauge, an instrument is primary when it provides you with the most direct indication of attitude or performance and is supporting when another instrument in its group is primary. So we have three groups and each group is a type of maneuver or action, right? Pitch, bank, and power. And then the instruments in these groups are what are changed by that action. So pitch, right? A change in pitch will result in a change in the altimeter, the airspeed indicator, the VSI, and the attitude indicator. Then for bank, a change in bank would change the heading indicator, turn coordinator, attitude indicator, and magnetic compass. And then for power, right, we would see a change, if we change power, made an action in terms of power, we would see a change in the airspeed indicator, tachometer, and manifold pressure gauge. And then an instrument is primary when it provides you with the most direct indication of attitude or performance and is supporting when another instrument in its group is primary. So let's talk about a couple of examples. And the first one is if we want to maintain a heading. So when maintaining a heading, the heading indicator would be primary, right? And that makes sense. So we learned that in private pilot training, right? When we're trying to maintain a heading, we're primarily looking at the heading indicator to make sure it is telling us what we want. So that would mean the turn coordinator, attitude indicator, and magnetic compass are supporting, okay? So again, this is in the group for bank. So if we remember the group for bank, there were three groups, pitch, bank, power. The group for bank was heading indicator, turn coordinator, attitude indicator, magnetic compass. And so if the action for that group is maintaining a heading, we'd have a primary instrument of heading indicator and the other ones, turn coordinator, attitude indicator, and magnetic compass would be supporting. Uh, another example would be maintaining an airspeed. When you want to maintain an airspeed, the airspeed indicator is primary and that tachometer or manifold pressure gauges are supporting. 
If you are not at your desired airspeed, the tachometer or manifold pressure for a power adjustment will support you in getting to that desired airspeed. So those supporting meth instruments can support you into getting what you want, but that primary instrument is going to be what you're mostly looking at primarily right during the maneuver. Let's talk about a couple more examples. Let's talk about maintaining an altitude. When you want to maintain an altitude, the altimeter is primary, right? So if we're trying to maintain 8,000 feet, what do we constantly kind of look at, right? It's the altimeter. And the airspeed in, that means the airspeed indicator, VSI, and attitude indicator would be the supporting instruments as part of that pitch group, okay? And supporting instruments can give you clues to if you are maintaining altitude or not, but they cannot definitively say if you are maintaining altitude. Only the altimeter can do that, and that's why it's primary. You may think that the attitude indicator could be primary in this instant. However, when maintaining level flight with constant power, the attitude indicator is the least appropriate in determining a need for pitch change. This is because the pitch attitude to maintain level flight is always changing with airspeed, air density, aircraft, and angle of attack. The attitude indicator instead is supporting and can be used to adjust and get to your desired altitude. As a rule of thumb, altitude corrections of less than 100 feet should be corrected by using pitch changes equal to about two and a half degrees or about a half bar on the attitude indicator. So here, let's say we're using the altimeter as our primary instrument, okay? And we see that we're 100 feet off. So then we would use the attitude indicator to support us getting to the altitude that we want. So we would do about two and a half degrees or a half bar on the attitude indicator of adjustment and pitch to correct that 100 feet on the altimeter. Let's do another example here, talking about making a standard rate turn to a desired heading and maintaining airspeed and altitude during that turn. In this situation, the altimeter will be primary for pitch because you want to maintain altitude. But the attitude indicator would be primary for bank. So we're doing multiple things here because we want to maintain airspeed and altitude as we turn to a desired heading. So the altimeter is primary for pitch. The attitude indicator would be primary for bank as we roll into the turn because we will get immediate feedback of our bank angle planned for the standard rate turn. The turn coordinator would then become primary for bank after you entered the turn because this tells you whether or not you are at a standard rate. So initially, the attitude indicator would be primary for bank as we roll in because it's going to give us the most immediate feedback. But then the turn coordinator, right, would be if we want to make sure we're at standard rate, that has the standard rate marker. So that would be help us maintain that standard rate in there and that would become primary. Once you have established a standard rate, the heading indicator will become primary because this will tell you once you have reached your desired heading. So we kind of have step through. We want to use our attitude indicator to kind of enter the turn. Then we use the turn coordinator to make sure we're at a standard rate turn. And then we use the heading indicator to make sure we roll out on the correct heading. The airspeed indicator will be primary for maintaining airspeed in the turn. And if you need to adjust, you will use the tachometer or manifold pressure as the supporting instruments for your airspeed indicator. I know that's a lot, but this is intuitively what you are doing. And this is the FAA and, you know, flight instructors way of communicating this into methods. But intuitively, you guys have already learned how to do this and do it naturally. Another couple examples here. Let's talk about climbing. While establishing a climb where you want to target an airspeed, your attitude indicator is the primary instrument because it will immediately give you feedback on your pitch. Your supporting instruments would then be the rest of the pitch instruments grouping, which would be altimeter, airspeed indicator, and VSI. For example, if you are in cruise flight at 115 knots and want to enter a best rate of climb at 89 knots for the aircraft in this example, then you would use an attitude indicator to pitch up. That would be your primary instrument. And you would pitch up to the known pitch attitude that will give you the best rate of climb speed for your aircraft. Again, the 89 knots we talked about. And then you would watch your airspeed indicator, that would be your supporting instrument, to see if it settles at your desired airspeed. You would then use your altimeter and VSI to ensure that you are climbing. When leveling off from a climb to level flight, your primary instrument should be your altimeter. And a good rule of thumb is to lead your level off altitude by 10% of your VSI reading during the climb. So for example, if you are climbing at 500 feet per minute 
and want to level off at 5,500 feet, you'd want to begin your level off when the altimeter reads 5,500 feet minus 10% or minus 10% of 500 or 5,500 feet minus 0.1 times 500, which is 5,000 feet, 500 feet minus 50 feet because 50 feet is 10% of 500. So you would start your level off at 5,450 feet. If maintaining heading or turning in a climb, the instruments would be used the same as discussed earlier for maintaining heading and making a standard rate turn. All right, let's do one more example. And this one is for if we want to descend or while we're descending. While establishing a descent where you want to target a descent rate, your VSI would be the primary instrument because it is the only instrument which gives your descent rate. Your supporting instruments would then be the rest of the pitch instrument grouping, which is altimeter, airspeed indicator, and attitude indicator. While establishing a descent where you want to target an airspeed, your airspeed indicator is the primary instrument because it is the only instrument which gives you your airspeed. And then your supporting instruments would then be the rest of the pitch instrument grouping, which is altimeter, BSI, and attitude indicator. So if you're not as worried about your descent rate, but you just want to maintain an airspeed, then you would have your airspeed indicator as primary. But if you want to make sure your descent rate is correct, which is more so likely the case, right, in instrument flying, we want to maintain the glide slope and our descent rates that are required of us of the IFR, you know, approach procedure, for example, then the VSI is going to be our primary and the rest would be supporting. When pulling out of a descent to level flight, your primary instrument should be your altimeter. A good rule of thumb is to lead your level off altitude by 50 feet during the descent when you want to maintain the same airspeed. For example, if you are descending and want to level off at 2,000 feet, you want to begin your level off when your altimeter reads 2,000 plus 50 or 2,050 feet. If you want to pull out of the descent at a higher airspeed, so that before we use 50 feet to pull out, so pull out 50 feet prior to the altitude we're going to pull out for if we want to maintain the same airspeed. But if we want to pull out of the descent at a higher airspeed, then we would use a different procedure. To pull out of a descent with a higher airspeed, we would want to add power at about 100 to 150 feet prior to our desired altitude. So in this example, if our desired altitude is 2,000 feet and we want to level out at 2,000 feet with a higher airspeed, then we would add power at about 2,100 or 2,150 feet, you know, so again, 100 to 150 feet prior to that desired altitude. In this maneuver, the tachometer would be primary while the rest of the power instrument group would be supporting like the airspeed indicator. If maintaining heading or turning in a climb, the instruments are a descent in this example, the instruments would be used the same as discussed before for maintaining heading and making a standard rate turn. Now let's go discuss identifying attitudes and malfunctioning instruments. Identifying a malfunctioning instrument goes hand in hand with cross checking your instruments. So a good instrument pilot that continuously cross checks their instruments should spot that something is up very quickly. The key to identifying a malfunctioning instrument is understanding how the instruments work in unison. So let's talk about some examples of common maneuvers and what you as a pilot should be expecting to see on your instrument. So the first one, let's talk about hitching up and maintaining altitude. To pitch up while maintaining altitude, a pilot will need to apply back pressure to the yoke and reduce power. During these actions, the pilot should see an increase in pitch on the attitude indicator, a reduction in airspeed indication, no change in VSI or the altimeter, and a reduction in the tachometer for pitching down and maintaining altitude. To pitch down while maintaining altitude, a pilot will need to apply forward pressure on the yoke and add power. During these actions, the pilot should see a decrease in pitch on the attitude indicator, an increase in airspeed indication, no change in VSI or the altimeter, and an increase in the tachometer when doing a climb. To climb, a pilot will add power and back pressure on the yoke to pitch up to the pitch attitude that will give them their desired airspeed for climb. This will take practice in your aircraft to know what pitch attitude gives you either best rate or best angle of climb speed. Once you get, make a mental or kneeboard note of it. During these actions, the pilot should see an increase in pitch on the attitude indicator a decrease in airspeed indication, an increase in VSI, an increase in the altimeter, and an increase in the tachometer when doing a descent. 
To descend the pilot will use pitch to set the attitude according to the desired airspeed, reduce power, and then use pitch to make adjustments in airspeed accordingly. A pilot should know the general pitch attitude for their descent. A good rule of thumb is to use half the same pitch attitude you use in a best rate of climb speed climb for banking right and maintaining altitude. To bank right a pilot will turn the yoke to the right to enter the bank, use rudder to coordinate the turn, and may add a small bit of power to maintain altitude if desired. A standard rate turn may not need any addition of power to maintain altitude, but the steeper the turn, the more power is needed to maintain altitude. A good rule of thumb is to add 10% of the reading on the tachometer in a deep turn to maintain altitude. During these actions, the pilot should see the attitude indicator show a right bank, the turn coordinator show a right turn with the ball reacting to your rudder input, and remember, step on the ball to center it, and an increase in heading indication, and the airspeed indication relatively constant or decreasing, and altimeter constant and VSI relatively constant. Then for banking left and maintaining altitude. To bank left a pilot will turn the yoke to the left to enter the bank, use rudder to coordinate the turn, and may add a small bit of power to maintain altitude if desired. A standard rate turn may not need any addition of power to maintain altitude, but the steeper the turn, the more power is needed to maintain altitude. A good rule of thumb is to add 10% of the reading on the tachometer in a deep turn to maintain altitude. During these actions, the pilot should see the attitude indicator show a left bank, the turn coordinator show a left turn with the ball reacting to the rudder input. Again, remember, step on the ball to center it. A decrease in heading indication, remember left is less. The airspeed indication relatively constant or decreasing. The altimeter constant and VSI relatively constant. I have a note here that it's helpful to remember the systems that each instrument comes from for your aircraft as it can help to determine if you have a failure to a system or not, maybe just an instrument. For example, the pitot system is the airspeed indicator. The static system is the airspeed indicator, altimeter, and VSI. Vacuum system is attitude indicator, heading indicator, and sometimes, but not usually, the turn coordinator, it's usually electrical. So if you remember those systems and what we already covered in the last few episodes, that is important to understand if specific instruments are not working correctly, as we just went over what to expect during certain maneuvers, if they're not acting as expected, and let's say you have you know, multiple instruments that all fit a particular system, for example, let's say the airspeed indicator, altimeter, and VSI during one of those maneuvers are all not acting as expected, then you can immediately kind of point to the static system in a whole as being your culprit for something that is going wrong. The FAA IFR written exam might ask you to interpret a set of six peck instruments in a figure. You will need to know which instruments are not acting in accordance with the others and are therefore malfunctioning themselves, or maybe a system is malfunctioning, and what the aircraft attitude or maneuver is with that snapshot of the six pack. This skill is one of the most critical skills in instrument flying. A good instrument pilot needs to be able to know how to read their instruments and when to trust their instruments. You got some practice doing this when you were flying under the hood or under the foggles during your private pilot training, right? Or sometimes you did unusual attitude training where you put your head down, your instructor would put you in an unusual attitude and then you had to use, with foggles on, use just the instruments to determine attitude. Now this takes it a step further. So not only do you have to determine your attitude, but you also have to determine if any of the instruments are malfunctioning or if a system is malfunctioning. And that's why it's important to know in each specific attitude and maneuver, what the instruments should be doing so that we can tell whether or not they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. So let's do an example. Note on all these examples is a yellow arrow showing the direction that the instrument is changing. However, this can be confusing because some instruments have a needle that moves while others have a stationary artificial aircraft or index that does not move, but the face of the instrument moves behind it. The arrow always corresponds to the direction that the moving part of the instrument is moving. For example, the heading markings on a heading indicator spin according to the yellow arrow, but the index aircraft in front of it does not move such that a left arrow means an increase in heading which corresponds to a right turn. Let's do an example. The question is, determine if an instrument or system is failed and determine the attitude or maneuver of the aircraft. 
Now, to do this on the podcast, so you would be given a figure, right? A figure or a picture snapshot of a six pack of instruments with yellow, some have yellow arrows around it pointing in the direction that, again, the moving part of the instrument is moving. And then some do not. And when they don't have an arrow, that means it's stationary at that reading for the instrument. So to do this on the podcast, I'm going to have to explain what each of the instruments on the six pack look like. So starting from the top left, we have the airspeed indicator. It looks like it's at about 200 and just above 250 knots. Let me kind of zoom in here to see that. Yeah, it's just, or sorry, just above about 230 knots. And it also has a arrow that is pointing clockwise. Okay, a yellow arrow pointing clockwise. That means the airspeed indicator shows about 225, 230 knots and is increasing because the arrow is pointing clockwise and what moves on the airspeed indicator is the needle. So when the needle moves clockwise, that means it increases in indication, right? It goes from 225 to 230 to 240 to 250 and so on. Now, the attitude indicator in the center, top row center, it shows a pitch up bank right angle. So the artificial aircraft is in the blue. So sky high blue, right? It's in the blue. And then the right wing is kind of crossing into the horizon. So it's a pitch up and right bank attitude. There's no arrow on this. So it's kind of a constant attitude we can assume. Then on the top right of the six pack, we have an altimeter. The altimeter currently reads 3,820 feet. And there's a yellow arrow also pointing clockwise. On an altimeter, the needles are what moves. So when the needles move clockwise, the altitude increases. So this altimeter shows a rising altitude starting from 3,820 feet. Now going to the bottom left, we have a turn coordinator. The turn coordinator shows a slipping turn to the right. So our aircraft is right wing down to about a standard rate turn notch to the right. And then our coordination ball is slightly to the inside of the turn, meaning we're a little bit uncoordinated. We're a little bit in a slip turn to the right. Then in the bottom middle, we have our heading indicator. The heading indicator shows increasing heading. I turn to the right. So increasing heading means a turn to the right. And the way we know that is because they have the heading indicator and has a yellow arrow pointing counterclockwise. This is kind of the confusing one that gets people when they do these types of questions. On a heading indicator, you have an artificial aircraft or index at the top that does not move, it's stationary, but the wheel behind it with all the numbers, the compass, right? The compass wheel, that's what rotates. So when that rotates counterclockwise, the numbers on the index get bigger. So it's starting at about 250. So our aircraft index in this picture is at 250, but The wheel is rotating counterclockwise, so that means it's going to go to 250, to 260, to 270, right? We're increasing in our heading numbers. So going from 250 to 260, 270, that would be a right turn or a turn to the right. So that's what we see on the heading indicated. And then finally, on the bottom right, we have our VSI. VSI has no yellow arrow around it, so we can assume that it's constant and it shows a value of about 500 feet, positive 500 feet. So we can assume that we're in a constant climb of 500 feet per minute. In this example, we have an attitude indicator, turn coordinator, and heading indicator all showing a bank to the right. The attitude indicator, altimeter, and VSI all show a climb. The airspeed indicator, already at a fast speed in the warning area, shows an increasing airspeed which does not follow the clues that lead us to this aircraft climbing. So we must ask ourselves if the the airspeed indicator is wrong or if the altimeter, VSI, and attitude indicator are wrong. To answer this, let's consider the common pedostatic system failures that we learned about a few lessons ago. So first, let's consider a situation with a blocked pedo probe. So with no pedo or ram air, the airspeed indicator will go to zero. Now let's consider the situation where we might have a blocked pedo probe and blocked drain. With no pedo or ram air and the drain hole blocked, the airspeed indicator will remain unchanged if no altitude changes are made. If you climb during this situation, the airspeed will show faster than normal. If you descend during this situation, the airspeed will show slower than normal. We covered these back when we talked about the pedostatic system a couple lessons ago. So if you want to go review that, go ahead. And then finally, let's consider a blocked static source. With a blocked status source, all of your airspeed indicator, VSI, 
and altimeter are affected. If climbing, the airspeed will decrease, and if you descend, it will increase. Your altimeter will freeze at the altitude it indicated when blockage occurs. Your VSI will slowly trend to zero feet per minute and then remain frozen there. So with all these to consider, we can rule out a pitot probe blockage because the airspeed is not going to zero knots. We can also rule out a blocked static source because our VSI is not going to zero feet per minute and our altimeter is not frozen in place. But if we look at what happens during a climb with a blocked pitot probe and blocked drain hole, we see our exact situation, a climb where our airspeed indication continues to climb. So if we remember the figure, right, the FAA figure that we have here labeled, so again, it's much easier in the online ground school where we have each instrument on the six pack labeled as to what it's doing. But if we look at that, it's the exact situation that we would expect to have a blocked pitot probe and blocked drain is occurring. Our airspeed indication is high and increasing. And so that happens with a blocked pitot probe and blocked drain when we are climbing, right? The airspeed continues to increase and we're in a climb, right? Because our the snapshot of the six pack showed our altimeter increasing. It showed us in a pitch up attitude and it showed a VSI, a positive VSI. So we know we're in a climb because, you know, three different instruments tell us that. And then our airspeed is continuing to increase, which doesn't make sense in a climb, but that would happen in a climb if our pedal probe and drain were both blocked. All righty, that has been our lesson on flight with instruments. A lot of good information for your flight training on there and even some examples that the FAA might test you on during your IFR FAA written exam. And we'll do some more questions kind of like that where, you know, examples where we get a screenshot of a six pack that you might see on some sort of exam next week, September 9th, on our lesson on recovery from unusual attitude. So again, now we're going to tie into diagnosing your six pack, diagnosing if there's any issues with your instruments and then recovering from whatever situation you find yourself in. So that'll be next week. And then after that, we'll talk about digital flight displays, GPS, and continue on going through all the instruments that you have to have a deep knowledge on to be a good IFR pilot. So thank you everybody for listening. And until next week, I will talk to you later. Hi, I just took my exams and I am so thankful to Nick for being there for me. I am a mother, I'm a professional, I'm a wife, I'm a daughter, I am a community worker. So given all these roles that I have to fulfill every day, the 24 hours is not enough. And I was at the verge of just giving it up my dream. It's not my profession. It's just my wish to be able to be a pilot. So do I have to do this? Can I do this? I was at a point where I thought when I thought this is it, I can't do it. Maybe in my next life. That's when part time pilot, I really mean it. I googled and it popped up. It's called part time pilot. And I asked, my family, should I just send the money and try it? Why not? I tried it. And I'm telling you, money well spent. And I can't tell you, there are so many commercial courses, excellent tree, you know, the kind of theory. They all give you similar theory that you need to pass this test. But what is so special about part-time pilot? Nick is special. He is a great teacher. He never turns you down. He is available on the speed dial. Um, you can text him, you can send him and shoot him an email, you can contact him via Facebook. You know, there was never a time, I really mean it, this is not an ad. I'm just saying it because I'm so grateful for what he has done. And, um, you know, no matter what, how simple the question is, I'm not at all good with math. And I would ask him, how do you do that? And he would simplify that for me. So I really, really want to say this simply because I scored 92%. And that is a great achievement given where I started this journey from, you know. So I would like for all those people like me who are out there, 
struggling and second guessing whether you can do this or not please make use of part time pilot and nick will get you there show him your dedication and he'll get your dream come true love it nick keep doing what you're doing this is not for money man you're not a commercial guy you're an excellent teacher you teach from your heart and you know this felt um in every session that you run hours and hours the money that you charge me is nothing the hours that you gave me is everything what a lovely knowledge to learn from you all right have a great one guys if you need any help nick is there just jump in and get that part time pilot support so that he can continue to do what he is doing great work great pilot nick take care bye bye guys